from the time it was really first identified, the giant forest has always been recognized as, well, we have to say the ultimate giant sequoia grove. John Muir recognized that instantly clear back in the 1870s. He came south in the early 1870s from Yosemite, and he named this place the giant forest. He recognized clear back 140 years ago that there were more big trees here and I don't just mean more sequoias, but more of the very biggest monarch sequoias than really in any other grove, that this was the ultimate grove. It eventually became the primary feature of Sequoia National Park. And although those of us who have worked here could argue that the park has countless stunning features, when you look at the way the park has been developed and you look what visitors do and you look at the way the Park Service serves visitors, there's no doubt that this remains the primary feature of the park. Nearly everyone who comes to Sequoia National Park visits the giant forest. Giant forest, I think, is the most beautiful sequoia grove and partly because you are able to easily experience it. It's really flat and, and you're able to hike it all over it really easily. It's fun to hike in giant forest. You know, there are a lot of trails, 40 miles of trails, so you'd think there'd be a lot of people out here, but, you know, oftentimes you get away from the more popular trails and you're out in the forest all by yourself. In the early days, one of the challenges of this place was to get to it at all. The task of making the giant forest accessible fell to its early protectors. And this dates back to the era before park rangers, when the park was administered in its early years by the United States Army. Cavalry troops protected the park. Cavalry troops acted as the park's rangers. And it was one of the best remembered of those early cavalrymen, a captain then in the cavalry named Charles Young, later a colonel, who finished the first road to Giant Forest, built for wagons and stagecoaches. His story is almost as amazing as the story of the big trees. He was a black American and only the third of his race to ever persevere and succeed in making it through West Point. People had tried to finish it before, but in 1903, Colonel Young finished that road into Giant Forest, bringing the first substantial numbers of recreational users. And by the late 1890s, people were already coming here by muleback to stay in tent cabins and to camp. And by 1903, we had a wagon road that became later an automobile road. And we grew up a lodge and big campgrounds. And so by the 1930s, we had 300 rooms for rent every night and 400 campsites, and a, a summer community of several thousand people right in amongst the big trees. And if you have places for people to stay, then you have to have services to, to help those people. So then you had stores and markets and gas stations and all of that. So it just more and more development. Ironically, two of the most significant people in the history of this place were colonels. Colonel Young, the cavalry officer who did so much to make this accessible, and Colonel John Roberts White, a retired military officer who came here in 1920 as superintendent of the park and stayed for a quarter century. He was an obstructionist to, to stop development in the giant forest area. He was, in the 1930s, you know, he said, maybe it's not such a good idea we have everything right here in giant forest. All the camping, all the facilities, all the roads, all the cars, you know, right in the middle of the th very thing that we're supposed to be protecting and preserving. There was enormous pressure in those years to retain the development in Giant Forest, and that pressure continued through the 1930s and 40s and 50s and even into the 1960s. But the problems he had identified did not go away, and in fact, they became ever more clear. And over time, water systems, sewer systems were beginning to fail. I can remember toward the end doing campfire programs in the amphitheater at Giant Forest and having a sewage break at the top of the amphitheater and uh, having to call maintenance because all kinds of stuff was going to be flowing through the amphitheater during your program. It was a race against time to actually move out before everything just totally failed. It wasn't until the early 1970s that the Park Service had substantial public support and leadership and concession support for removing development from Giant Forest. And it was finally not until the early 1980s that we finally committed to a redesign of Giant Forest that took another 20 years. It came down to the wire, but the National Park Service was successful in getting Wuxachi Lodge built and being able to 
completely closed down giant forest after 1998. We had almost 300 buildings, most of them between 50 and 90 years old. And they were filled with just about every toxic material that anybody had put in any kind of building in the last century. And so we simply didn't go in and knock them down and throw them into dump trucks and be done with it. We had, in fact, first to remove an enormous amount of toxic material that had been cemented into walls and foundations and attics. We then had to remove the structures themselves, and that had to be done in a way that did minimum damage to the trees and soils around them. Well, the demolition of these buildings was really a challenging thing. First, it was done by a contractor using heavy equipment, so we had to take a lot of measures to be sure that we did not damage the giant sequoia trees and other natural resources during that process with using things like fencing and other protective measures that were in the contracts. Then we faced the challenge of the biological restoration, which was to turn much of this area back toward a more natural state. Because we were doing something new, we have tried that most important of human goals. We have tried to learn something while we carried out our restoration here. In the restoration of giant forests, we tried a number of techniques to determine which of them would work best and which of them was really the minimal technique that was necessary to restore the vegetation. We tried just restoring soil properties by decompacting the soil and adding organic matter and letting the vegetation come in on its own naturally. We tried placing forest fuels, litter and duff, needle litter, in the forest and burning it. And we also tried restoring soil properties and also planting um, trees, shrubs, and grasses and wildflowers. What we found was that the burning treatment provided the most natural results. You get fast growing giant sequoia seedlings and you get high species diversity. 10 years after the implementation of, of most of the restoration here in Giant Forest, it's really easy to forget that there were ever buildings here. All of the before and after pictures of where buildings were and what it looks like now, you can't even believe almost 300 buildings were here by moving things out of giant forest and making it a forest again, is protecting the landscape, protecting the forest, protecting the wildlife. We regained the world's best sequoia grove for the future. I don't think anyone who comes here and spends time will argue that the giant forest itself is priceless and worth a major investment to save. You can find hotels and gas stations and parking lots anywhere, but there's only one giant forest, and it's here in Sequoia National Park, and that's what people come here to enjoy.